The mind. It holds our most treasured abilities. To think and to choose. To will and to do. To learn and to love. To believe and to worship. It is the center of our being. It is the organ that is fundamentally us and that cannot be transplanted or transferred. Is this why the book of Revelation reveals that the great war is for our minds? That the vital question is whether the seal of God or the mark of the beast will rest on our minds? How can we ensure we win the battle in our minds? Join us from 10th to 24th October as we explore how to fortify our minds physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Happy Sabbath, friends. I mean, we're excited to have you again this evening. We have been together through this journey, you know, and um, God has blessed us I'm sure he's blessed you in a special way. So we want to invite you also this evening to still listen to God's word. I mean, it's on Friday. The sun has set. Um, you're in the house. I'm sure you know a friend. Perhaps you can give them form, as we say, for tonight. You can send out that link and tell them, hey, there's something wonderful happening. Um, at Karengata via this link. Please check it out. So we want to invite you, please uh, text your friends, send the link, uh, join us. Uh, this blessing is not only meant for you, um, but God can give you the greater blessing of also participating in the blessing of someone else in their experience. So we still want to invite you to send out these invitations and um, I'm grateful that you're doing so. I mean, it's Sabbath. I'm excited. A wonderful day of rest. Um, did you know that I, especially on this day, God is closest to his children? Especially on this day, God's children desire his choicest blessings. And did you know that God has promised that he will not let the sincere prayer go unanswered? He will not allow the sun to set till he's responded to your request. So you have anything you want to tell God, to talk to him about, a burden that you want him to lift, a victory that you want him to play out in your life? Friend, no better time than this Sabbath day. So we're excited to have you. It's been a journey specifically for tonight we we'll consider something also which is important. So before I tell you, I just want to invite you also to pray with me. Our gracious Father in heaven, we count it a privilege indeed to see this Sabbath day. I mean, it's a rhythm which you started. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then on the seventh, we stop. We stop not because we don't have things to do. We stop because you simply said, stop and consider me. Have fellowship one with another, communion with me. Lord, we just want to invite and invoke your spirits to be with us. We also are desirous of your special and choice Sabbath blessings. So bless us indeed with your word. Bless us. It's our sincere prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Battle HQ. Tonight we consider post-traumatic growth. Now friends, one important dimension of what it means to be human has to do with the internal aspect of human existence. You know, one crucial aspect of human existence is something Perhaps you understand and you know privacy, you know, specifically internal privacy. And this covers the privacy of your life insofar as it deals with facts of your existence that are not open 
you know, the psychological aspect of your life, the emotional aspect of your human existence. You know, there is a part of our existence that no one can enter into. You know, your thoughts are not accessible. There is no scientific tool that you can use and I can use to access your thoughts and you to access mine. You know, our thoughts are always hidden. You know, we are permanently inaccessible as human beings in as far as our thoughts are concerned. You know, so one important aspect of being human I mean, we are characterized by hiddenness. There's always that part of our existence that no one else knows. But guess what, friends? Only God has access to our internal life. Only God knows the internal dimensions of our existence. God knows, what go God knows what's going on inside of us. Only God can come close to those parts. So one of the greatest poverties as we consider this is that we do not allow that sharing of our hiddenness with God who has access to that part or to those hidden parts. And friends, the beauty of this dimension, this internal dimension and space is that we can only fully share it with who? With God. In that space you can't lie. I mean, it's the only space that you can be raw you, not textual you, raw you, just the way you are. He understands that which is hidden. So sometimes you may even be talking to someone and you may be trying to explain to them perhaps facts of your existence, but you still feel that, you know, I don't, I have not spoken. It's because we are simply hidden beings. Now, friends, we want to invite you tonight. You know, the Bible emphasizes, emphasizes consistently that, you know, God is the one who deals with the heart. You know, God is the one who searches the mind. That's what the Bible teaches. And think about this. Sometimes you may even tell someone that you have been raped. And after using all the words that you can, you know, master, you still feel that you've not told them the whole story. It's because we are dealing with what is hidden. There's no language that can relate that. You need a sphere where you can release that. And guess what? Tonight we're going to learn, you know, how can... God help us, you know, with the challenges that we experience at this deep, hidden, internal level, you know, such as those caused by traumatic, or traumatic experiences that we go through. And traumatic experiences can cause either of two things. They can cause post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, or through the power of God, you know, they can help us grow. So I want to invite you tonight to listen in to this particular message by Chad and Fordia Cruiser, Post-Traumatic Growth. God bless you as you listen in.
Well, I'm happy to be with you once again, and my name is Chad Cruiser, and my wife and I have a ministry called Anchor Point Films, making documentaries about the Bible, history, archaeology, and health. And we also have a YouTube channel called Health and Homestead. You can check us out on there. And before we begin our message, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to study your word. I pray that you would draw us nearer to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Some time ago, I read, not the book, but about a book, about a book called Ghost Boy. It's the true story of a, a 12-year-old boy who went through a health, traumatic health experience so bad that he, he became immobilized. He actually was to the point where he couldn't talk, he couldn't move, he couldn't respond. He was what we would typically call a vegetable, but he was alive, and so... His family had to take care of him, and it was so stressful because, you know, his mom really struggled with it, and so much so that she got to the point where it was, it was so traumatic for her, she said to, to him, I wish you were dead. But he could hear everything, and nobody knew. And his father was loving to him. He cared for him. He, he washed him. He bathed him. And he helped to feed him. And he would also daily take him to a home that would take care of him during the day because his parents would have to work. And while in the care facility where the people would take care of him, he went through various kinds of abuse. He was emotionally abused, you know, insulted, terrible things were said to him. But even much worse than that, he was physically abused. And he was also sexually abused. And people thought they could do whatever they wanted to him because he would never be able to respond. He was a vegetable. And so you can imagine the trauma as a 12-year-old boy all the way up to age 25. And, and he said in his book, Ghost Boy, he said, I hated Barney. I don't even know if you know what Barney is. And if you don't know, praise the Lord. Barney was this ridiculous television show about a giant, like, dancing purple dinosaur. He was absolutely ridiculous. I don't know that a human liked it. 
Uh, but beside the point, he said, I hated Barney and he was forced because he couldn't respond all the way up to 25 to watch this ridiculous show over and over and over. He said it was like a living nightmare to have to live like this. After going through all this, he was 25 years old and, and one of the care workers, one of the people at the facility, noticed that when things would be said to him as they probably kindly spoke to him, there would be these little tiny eye movements that an almost imperceptible smiles and that worker began to think, I think he can understand. And so she, this individual went to the parents and said, you need, to con you need to contact a doctor and find out. I think he can actually understand. And so they brought him to a doctor and sure enough, it turned out that he was totally cognizant, totally there. He just couldn't respond. But then they found a way for him to communicate through tiny little movements. And with those movements, he got to the point where he actually went to school, got a degree in something like computer science and went into working with computers or on computers and while he was in this state he uh, he met a woman or a woman went, met him and she shared Jesus with him and he ended up giving his life to Jesus because he wasn't raised as a Christian his family wasn't really religious and this woman after witnessing to him she later on married him one experience and and he shared that even though he wasn't raised a christian he always knew god was there with him in in the midst of all this just trapped in it's called total locked in syndrome he knew that god was with him and god used even that trial to bring him closer to god it's interesting sometimes we get angry because of what others go through and some people turn away from god because of the trials that others go through yet those same people sometimes come to god because of their trials we're going to talk about how the Bible says, and now even scientists are studying how trauma can actually make us stronger. We're going to get into that. Now, we all go through trials in life, really, uh, maybe not necessarily like this boy, Martin Pistorius, went through this total locked-in syndrome. But in the last days, we are all going to go through difficulties. I don't say this as a threat. It's, it's a reality. And this is the thing. Even if we weren't in the last days, you're still going to go through trouble, right? But we're going to go through, in a special way, difficulties in the last days. And these things can either, it's up to us, we can either turn away from God because of them, or we can draw closer to God because of them. It's really up to us. I was reading some time ago in Scientific, this article in Scientific American by uh, Brett Kaufman, and he talks about something called kintsugi. Kintsugi is a Japanese art where this ancient art where they would take broken pottery and they would glue it back together, but not just glue it. They would actually use silver or gold in, in, and they would actually connect it back together. So you'd have the pot like it used to be, except for you could see these veins of gold or these veins of silver and, and the the pottery would kind of own its brokenness. You could see the brokenness, but the brokenness actually made it even more beautiful. And God can do the same thing with us, that he can actually make us more beautiful through the trials that we go through. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to begin in verse 35. Romans, the 8th chapter and verse 35. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, we're going to begin there. And it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sakes we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor th things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So notice Paul, someone who had been beaten. He had been shipwrecked. He had been stoned. He had been gone through all of these torturous experiences. And he said, nothing is able to separate us from Christ if we want to hold on to him. We may choose to reject him, but if we, are, if we are willing to cling to Christ, he will give us the strength to go through any trial that we could possibly go through. You know, psychologists now are looking, you've probably heard of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, how some people, after going through a, a traumatic event like war, 
uh, they end up having this stress maybe for years or even for the rest of their life it becomes a disorder that they're just troubled maybe they hear a, a snap and it terrifies them you know feeling like it's gunfire or what have you but researchers are now talking about something contrary to post-traumatic stress they actually call it post-traumatic growth post-traumatic growth now we could think of people in the bible that had post-traumatic growth uh, we, we could talk about many examples. I, I can think of, you know, Samson, who went through serious trials, and he did grow after that. I can think of Joseph, the incredible difficulties he went through going from the, you know, from the prison to the slavery to the pit and ultimately to the palace. And he grew and he stayed strong. He stayed connected with Christ through all of it. And we all have that opportunity to choose to be faithful. I think of Isaiah and Jeremiah. Jeremiah was thrown into a, a mud pit up to his up to his chest in mud, in muck, in a in a well. And yet he was faithful to God. Friends, Jesus can give us strength to be faithful faithful through all the difficulties. And we think of the I think of even the apostles. The apostles went through all kinds of struggles. You know, they were healing and they were preaching. And for preaching and healing, they were thrown into prison. You remember the time where they're, they're in Acts chapter 5, they were, they were beaten. And, and uh, it's interesting, they told them, you ought not preach in this name, in the name of Jesus. And they, weren't, you know, they were angry with them for doing a miracle. And the response of the apostles in Acts chapter 5 was that in verse 40 to 42, they ultimately end up saying, we ought to obey God rather than man. But then the text goes on to say that they, they went on and they rejoiced that they were found worthy to suffer persecution for Jesus' sake. Isn't that amazing to think that you, you could have people beat you and, and do all manner of evil to you and you praise the Lord that you could go through such an experience. Lord, help us to love our enemies and not hate those who we perceive to be our enemies because their lives may be changed as a result of it. You know, I think of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. If you have your second, we're in Romans. Uh, Acts, Romans, then we're going to go on to 1 Corinthians, and then 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice what Paul himself went through. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and in the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, we're going to begin in verse 24, 24 to 28. What do we read? Paul says, Of the Jews, five times received I stripes, meaning whips, you know, save one. So he, 39 stripes. He said, I went through that five different times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered a shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. And in journeys often in perils of waters and perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness and watchings often in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things which are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the saints, or all the churches. So Paul said, I I've gone through all of these things. I've gone through all of these trials. And if that weren't bad enough, if that weren't difficult enough, notice what he says in chapter 12. In chapter 12, he says there in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So Paul has this, this messenger of Satan, this trial. Some believe that it's actually that he had terrible eyesight and that he wanted God's help in this situation because in other places in the New Testament, he says, I, you would have ripped your eyes out and given them to me if you could. Well, why would I say, oh, you would rip your eyes out and give them to me? I mean, that's just kind of a strange way of talking to somebody. But maybe they knew he had difficult seeing. Maybe not, but that, that's, uh, some people believe that was the trial that he went through. But then what ends up happening? Um, he says in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that he might, it might depart from me. And he, God, said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore... Will I rather glorify in my, or gladly therefore, will I rather glorify in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? You know, you think about this with Paul. 
How could Paul get to the point where he said, I will glory in my difficulties? How could he get to that point? We're going to go through trials in the last days. You may be going through trials right now. Jesus cares for you in the midst of your trial. And how could Paul get to the point where he could overcome in the midst of all of this? Well, he had an experience. He had formerly been walking on the road to Damascus. He actually, his job was persecuting Christians before he gave his life to Jesus. And here he was going down the road to Damascus and he came face to face with the resurrected Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Meaning it's hard for you to, sometimes you kick against something and it hurts you. You kick against some thorns, it's very painful. And he was kicking against maybe even Christ. And he was fighting him and it was painful for him to persecute people because deep down he knew something wasn't right, I believe, because there's a Holy Spirit. And as he met Jesus face to face, he, he asked, Lord, what would you have me to do? And Jesus tells him, you're going to suffer many things for my sake. Imagine Jesus, imagine starting your ministry by Jesus saying, you're going to go through a lot of suffering. Well, pro Paul probably was convicted, man, I made a lot of other people suffer. I, I deserve it. And so Paul went forward, and because of his experience meeting Jesus, he was able to go through the trials and then help other people through the difficulties they went through, and even help us in the last days as we remember the Apostle Paul's words, right? That my strength, that God's strength is sufficient for us, that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. He can give us the ex experience that rather than having post-traumatic stress, we may have, by the grace of God, post-traumatic growth. And we can share this story, this testimony through all eternity. You know, I'm going to show you uh, these characteristics. There's basically five areas that psychologists are talking about in the midst of post-traumatic growth. There's five areas of growth that people often go through that have a traumatic experience and grow from it. Remember, some people don't grow from it. Some people, it crushes them. And some people, it, it helps them to grow. Now, the good news is God can make all of us, even if you've been crushed by your pain of the past, God, I believe, even in the pain you've already gone through, can turn it upside down so that that can be made into an area of growth in your life. I know it's happened in my life. Uh, I'll maybe get back to that later. But look in Philippians chapter 4. So we're in Corinthians. The next book is Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And in Philippians chapter 4, I think we see that Paul has all five of these areas of post-traumatic growth. We can actually see it in his experience. So read along with me. In one of the ways that the psychologists reveal that people are finding growth from a traumatic experience is that they end up having a greater appreciation of life. A greater appreciation of life. And Paul seemed to have this. Look in, in Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, where it says, Not that I speak in respect of want or lacking things, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be, what? Content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he says, how did he get to this point? How did he get to the point where he says, I'm content even going through sufferings. He says, the next verse, and you probably know this, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So Paul had this greater appreciation of life. Why? Because Jesus gave him victory. He helped him even in the trials enjoy and find the blessings of life because he grew through the trials that he had been through. Through the trials that he had been through. Now, also, another, a second aspect of post-traumatic growth is that people begin to have a, a greater appreciation and strengthening of close relationships. So his trials actually, and his experience with Christ actually enhanced his personal relationships. Notice with me in verse 1. We're looking in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. If we talk to that t way together today, many people would feel comfortable if I said, I mean, as a p pastor, you're, I'm not a pastor, but as, as a speaker, you might think, okay, uh, you might say, my dearly beloved, the ones I long for, maybe you would think of that. But in general, if I spoke to that people that way, you know, that I just knew, they'd be kind of, oh, oh, my dearly beloved, you know. But, but look at the way he loved the people in the church. The compassion that he had, you can see that this strengthened his love. And these were love for the people that he once hated. So this is amazing. So post-traumatic growth, we also see that here in Paul's experience. Number three, 
is that they find that there's a, the identification of new possibilities or a new purpose in life. Do we see this in Paul's life? Look in verse 9. It says in verse 9, it says, the, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. He had a new purpose in life, and that was calling people to become like him as he had become like Christ. To be a witness to other, others, Paul had found this purpose, this new goal in life. And that's what he did after he met Jesus Christ and as he went through these trials for Christ's sake, he found a great purpose in his life. Number four, Paul found in people in post-traumatic situations, post-traumatic growth, they often find greater awareness and utilization of personal strengths. So they find new strengths they didn't know and new awareness of those personal strengths. And so notice it in verse 13, we already said it, I can do all what? Things through Christ which strengthens me. So Paul believed he could do all things not by himself, not because he was good, not because he was the apostle Paul, but because Christ could strengthen him. So he found new strength in Jesus to go through trials. And number five on this list of post-traumatic growth is he found an enhanced spiritual development. Now there's no question, that's all over Paul's writings, that he found growth in Jesus Christ. And so friends, we can experience these same five things. We can experience, even if you've gone through something that's so traumatic that you hate even thinking about it, God can give you victory of it. I remember I had a situation in my life where I, uh, I was in a fight with a couple of guys. This is before walking with Jesus. Uh, I believed in Jesus. I would have called myself a Christian, but I was not walking with Jesus. And I, I these, got in a fight with a couple of guys, and these two guys beat the living junk out of me. And I really deserved it, to be honest with you. I really needed it. And, but for a while, it, it made me angry. When I would think about it, I would get really, really angry. But now I'm actually happy that it happened. I've actually grown because of it. And by the way, I never got in another fight after that. I, <laughs> I learned my lesson, you know. But here's the thing. I realized it changed my life for the better. Now, if somebody, you know, sexually abuses you, that itself doesn't make you, you know, that's something that's traumatic, that's very difficult. But the good news is even that, and we'll talk more about that in other messages potentially, how God can give us victory. He can help us to change, uh, forgive, and you'll find out more about that as we go forward. But God can set us free no matter what we have gone through. And he helped me to grow through this, this experience that I had gone through. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, Though he were a son, referring to Jesus, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things which he suffered. Meaning, Jesus learned to be obedient to the Father through suffering. And so too we, if we're really going to be faithful to God, we're going to suffer. And you'll suffer even if you're not faithful to God. But why not suffer for God and find the joy that comes along with it and the result of it, a post-traumatic growth? Now, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, and we already read this together, but it bears repeating. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. This, this idea of Jesus, that Jesus suffered in the flesh, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. This is what Jesus did. He suffered in the flesh and he lived out to the will of God. He lived faithfully. And we should have the same mindset that we're willing to suffer to become overcomers. Sometimes people have a false conception about, about finding victory. They think, oh, oh, uh, you know, it should just be easy to find victory. It should be easy. If you're, if you're walking in faith, it's easy to overcome temptation. Not necessarily. The Bible says Jesus, to overcome temptation, suffered. Sometimes it is easy. You just, wow, God gave me the victory. Other times it's a battle. But that battle can draw us closer to Jesus than if we never went through that battle. So, let's think about this. He, thinking of all of these things... Notice this quotation here. The result of trials that God's people go through can actually make them closer than the angels. This is unbelievable. This is from a book called Desire of Ages. It says, The angels of glory find their joy in giving. Giving love and tireless watch care to the souls that are fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of men. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. By gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the 
human spirit to bring the lost into a fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves could know. Can you imagine drawing closer to God than even the angels could possibly draw to, to Christ? But this is what they're doing. The Bible says in Hebrews 1 that they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to us, to those who shall be heirs of salvation. The angels are going forth to minister, to draw us near to Christ, even closer than they themselves can know. And it's because of the trials that we've gone through and, and learning to cling to Christ in the difficulties, in the trials, in the darkness, even when we feel like he's not there, but we cling to him anyway. It's through that that we draw closer than even the angels themselves have ever experienced. We can have, and if we're faithful to Jesus, we will have post traumatic growth. But that doesn't mean that whole process is easy because it's post-traumatic. Trauma, difficulty, pain, suffering. But we can grow like Paul did through Jesus and like Jesus did through his connection to his heavenly Father. So we think of how this is going to be at the end of time. There's a church called the Laodicean Church, the lukewarm church that has been unfaithful that hasn't been walking, they're, they're miserable, they're wretched, they're poor, they're blind, they're naked. Yet their character has changed somehow through the love of Jesus, through the love of God. And their, their character is as gold tried in the fire, in the fires of difficulty, of persecution, of suffering, something happens to them. And notice what the Bible says in, in Revelation chapter 3. If you got your Bibles, you may have heard these words before. But speaking to the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3, 21 and 2, says, To him that overcometh. Now you don't overcome something without a trial or without difficulty. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that has, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What a thought. To him that overcometh, Jesus says, I'm going to allow you to sit on my throne. Who sits on a throne? Only kings. You're thinking, why would God let us sit on the throne of the heavenly king? What? The Bible says that we too will become priests and kings. Now, we will not become God, just in case you're wondering. No, we will always be created beings that trust in all of our goodness to Jesus. All, every decent thing, every good thing that ever could be in us all comes from the Spirit of God, from Jesus Christ himself. And so what do we see here? What we see is that God is going to work this miracle that we will be so close to him that we'll sit down on his throne. I can't even imagine. Can you? Wow. This is what he offers to the over comer. Friends, Jesus cares for you. No matter what you've been through, he, he felt for you in the trials, in the traumas that you've already been through, and he'll be there with you through all the other trials that you will ever go through. But some years ago, I, I read a story with my wife, and we just read it again a few months ago because it was just such a good book. That um, it's, it's a story of a woman by the name of Darlene Diebler. And she talks about her experience going through, she was a missionary. She went to Papua New Guinea um, and PNG, as many of us know it, of it. And she goes to PNG. And while she's there, she's a missionary with her husband. They were from the United States, but they went to be missionaries in PNG. And while they were there, they were sharing the message. They were going out into the outback or to the wilderness, to people who had never seen outsiders like this. They had only seen their tribes, people from the area. And here comes this, this white lady and her husband. And actually, first the husband came alone and, and he told them, I have, I have a wife. And, and uh, they, they actually thought maybe his wife was a ghost. They were kind of confused about the whole situation. And to find out if she really was a human, they went and they yanked on her hair really hard. And sure enough, she was real. But nevertheless, that wasn't the great trial she went through. She grew to love these people and cared for them and they ministered to them and witnessed to them and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. But then World War II broke out. And the Japanese, first the Nazi, German Nazis uh, arrived in planes to this, to this area of PNG. Actually, they were on the coast at this point. The Nazis arrived, and then after that, the, 
uh, Japanese arrived and the Japanese ultimately took over the area and they threw the people into prison camps, especially people that were foreigners like these Americans and the, the Japanese were fighting against America. And so they threw the Americans into a prison camp along with Europeans and various other people who were there in Papua New Guinea. And so there they are in this, this concentration camp going through starvation diets. There's beatings, there's abuse, there just all kinds of difficulty they were going through along with the stomach troubles and uh, just all kinds of things that they went through. And Darlene Diebler, her husband, ended up dying in another concentration camp. They separated the men from the women and he died there and they didn't tell her for months and months. It might have even been a year before they actually told her that her husband died. And she found out and it just broke her. You can imagine she was a relatively newlywed, only been married a few years. This is her ministry partner, the one that she loved. He was an incredible, godly man, and he has died. She finds this out, and Mr. Yamaji, the head of the prison camp, the Japanese uh, guard, the man who would beat these women, she had seen this man beat people almost to death. He treated people absolutely horrible, but he had made Darlene one of the leaders of the camp. And in the midst of this, as she finds out her husband died, Mr. Yamaji is touched by this woman because she's been such a good worker. She's been such a good woman. Her character reflected Jesus Christ. And she finally came to him. And I'm going to read to you a little portion uh, from her book. So she had, on top of that, she had been thrown into another concentration camp where they starved her almost to death. But notice what happens here when she's back by Mr. Yamaji, this the interrogator, the man who's beaten people. She's seen him almost kill people. Notice what happens. So it says here, we read, Late one afternoon, Mr. Yamaji called me to his office. He was standing behind his desk. Nyonya Diebler, Mrs. Diebler, I'm guessing that means. I want to talk with you, he began. This is war. Yes, sir. I, I understand that. Uh, yes, Mr. Yamaji, I understand that. What you've heard today about your husband's death, women in Japan have heard. Yes, Mr. Yamaji, I, I understand that also. You are young. Someday the war will be over and you can go back to America. You can go dancing, go to the theater, marry again. He didn't understand all of Christianity. And forget these awful days. You may be, you have been a great help to the other women in the camp. I ask of you, don't lose your smile. Mr. Yamaji, may I have permission to talk to you? He nodded and sat down. Then he motioned me for, to take the chair across from him. Mr. Yamaji, I don't sorrow like people who have no hope. I want to tell you about someone of whom you may have never heard. I learned about him when I was a little girl in Sunday school in Boone, Iowa, in America. His name is Jesus. He's the Son of Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. God opened the most wonderful opportunity to lay the plan of salvation before the Japanese camp commander. Tears started to course down his cheeks. He died for you, Mr. Yamaji. And he put love in our hearts, even for those who are our enemies. That's why I don't hate you, Mr. Yamaji. Maybe God brought me to this place to tell you that he loves you. It seems as if this man's life was changed after this. He became a different man. He was kinder to people. And it's interesting, this woman who had gone through so much trauma, so much difficulty, she actually used this to share the love of Jesus with the man who had been persecuting her and her friends. Not only that, when the war was over, she ended up moving back to the United States. She later met another man. They too are married together and they moved back to Papua New Guinea to become missionaries again in that place that, had, that she had experienced so much suffering and pain in. I don't know what your difficulties have been. I don't know the trials you've been through. I know I've been through some. I'll probably tell you more later. I've gone through, I went through 10 years of terrible, terrible depression. Unbelievable. I mean, it was, it was horrendous. But you know what? I'm actually glad that I went through it. 
because I drew closer to Jesus. I never gave up on him. I don't mean that there weren't times where I was angry or struggling, but I never gave up on Jesus through those 10 years. And, and when the darkest time, the darkest moments of the depression went through my mind, I, I actually thought at one point, what if I have to live with this forever? And you know what the very next thought was in my mind? Then I just accept it. Where would I go? You have the words of life. I knew Jesus was the only answer. That I couldn't, there was nothing in this world. I've, I've been in the world. I know there's no, there's no joy there. There's no peace there. Do you have fun sometimes? Sure, you have fun, but you wake up empty. I was empty. I knew Jesus was the answer. And I knew that no matter what, by the grace of God, I needed to cling to him. And I praise his holy name that he helped me to cling to him through all the difficulties. And I want to challenge you, whatever you're going through, go, going through right now, don't give up. And if right now you're in, in a good, good place in your life, praise the Lord. But when you go through trials, learn to cling to Christ. Memorize some Bible promises so that when the trials do come, you have them. And even if, even if you don't go through some trial, maybe you're hit by a bus and you never see the trial. Maybe it's too late. But you could share the promises with others who are going through difficulties. Friends, Jesus wants you to experience post-traumatic growth. He can give you the victory. Is it your desire to say, Jesus, I want you to make me the person, the woman, the man, the child that you've created me to be. I want to be an overcomer through my Savior, Jesus Christ. Is that your desire? Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful that he gave his life to us, that he died on the cross, that he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And Father, we don't look forward to suffering, not at all. But Lord, in the midst of it, may we like Paul say, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May we, may we know these words. May they burn within us in the trials when we're at the deepest, darkest moments of our lives. May we simply repent and cling to you. May we trust in you for salvation, even if we can't feel it that will cling to the hem of your garment like the woman who reached out and just touched the hem of Christ's garment. May we find healing virtue from our Savior. We thank you for your love. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Even though we may be living in the present, you know, we may be plagued by the regrets of the past. You know, our present is filled with the pain of the past. Our present is filled with a history of I wish, if only I could, ifs that take us to the past and bracket us in its dark and painful experiences. You know, if I could turn back time, if I could go back, you know, perhaps things we wish we could undo, words which we wish we had not spoken or perhaps spoken. You know, the past is the past. We can change our past, but there is good news, friends, this night. We can give our past to Jesus. Listen to this promise in his word in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 25. He says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you, you know, friends, locusts can consume years of work in an instant. In moments, they can destroy. They have been likened to a great army. And tonight, you may have wasted the most of your life, you know, the most of your God-given strength, the vigor of your youth in serving sin and Satan. You know, his biddings you have done. Like Solomon, you may have turned from the joy of divine communion to find satisfaction in the pleasures of sense. You, might, you may have erected altars to your gods, heathen gods, but friends, tonight you learn how pain is their promise, how vain is their promise of rest to the spirit. By your own bitter experience, perhaps you are learning the emptiness of a life that seeks in it in, in earthly goods, its highest good. 
gloomy and soul harassing thoughts are maybe troubling you night and day. For you, there's no longer any joy of life. There's no peace of mind. There's no future. The future is only dark with despair. Perhaps like the prodigal, you have walked out of the commonwealth of God's grace, seeking freedom from restraint. No one to curtail your freedom. Like you know how he returned. You know, he returned as one who got what he wanted but lost what he had. And in his returning, he testifies that indeed it is only God's word, this truth that can make you free. Perhaps you wanted to taste of the forbidden fruits, you know. You are captured by the curiosity of the unexplored. You know, the neon lights, the rhythmic music, you know, they made it look desirable out there. But the prodigal on his way back home, he says, the way of the transgressor is had. Out there, only redness of eyes. Out there, swollen lips. Out there, the benumbing of the mental powers. Out there, venereal disease. Out there, loss of respect. He testifies on his way back that indeed God's ways, his ways, are ways of pleasantness. Perhaps you wanted to establish your own identity. But friends, tonight we tell you, there is no such thing as a successful sinner. They are sinners with power. They are sinners with money. They are sinners with property. But never have we met, never have I met a sinner with peace of mind. Perhaps you wanted the recognition that wealth and power provides. But when you found it, you found that you had tasted of the apples of Sodom and you found them but ashes. Perhaps tonight you are paralyzed by fear. Only ruin is the experience of your life. But God will not forsake you. Just as, as he did not forsake Solomon. Tonight, today, you can choose to serve Jesus. You can choose to give your heart to him. You can say to him, you know what, God, you can have my heart. He is calling you now. He wants you to make a fresh start. Just give him your heart. Just Give him your heart. Just give him your heart. Listen to this, friends. The griefs that lie too deep to be breathed into any human ear, I know you're experiencing that. Jesus says, I know those griefs. Think not that you are desolate and forsaken. Though your pain touch no responsive cord in any heart here on earth, look to me and leave. He says this, the mountains shall depart and the hills will be removed. But my loving kindness will not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Isaiah 54 and verse number 10. So tonight, my friends, we can experience growth even in our trials. Tonight, Jesus can turn these empty, watery experiences of our life into beautiful wine, beautiful wine experiences of goodness in our lives. That burden that threatens to make you faint, that challenge, that trial, that answer or that question that never seems to have an answer, that delay which seems so long and painful, that trial that seems to consume you, fear not, my friend, fear not. God watches closely over his one. The Bible says that his eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth, that he may shew himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Tonight, Tonight, my friend, you can choose to be with Jesus. This Jesus, who cares? He's interested in making you his friend. He wants to save you. He wants to unburden you. He cares. So I want to invite you in a special way this Sabbath day to begin something. Just as he, as he called the world to rest and stop on the sixth day, Jesus calls you to rest and stop in, from your life of sin. 
Do you know what he wants you to enter into? He wants you to enter into his Sabbath of rest. He wants you to experience the rest, friends, that comes as a result of knowing him as Lord and Savior. And so we invite you tonight. Make that bold decision. Write to us. Send us that text message in that number. Write that against that decision card that you know what? I want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior in my, in my life. I want, him to, I want him to be my friend. And friends, you know what? His ear is not closed so that he cannot hear you. Friends, you can see him by the eye of faith. Stop looking with your eyes and pierce through that particular pain that you are going through and see Jesus holding out this promise of rest for you. And he wants you to accept him. So write to us. Tell us that you also want to study. If that is your intention, that is your interest, we are also willing to study with you. So register through that particular link that we are now sharing. And we want to minister to you in the best way possible. So get in touch with us. Let me pray with you as we disperse tonight. Our gracious Father in heaven, you indeed are a loving God. We thank you because friend to friend, uh, unfaithful they may prove, but no changes can attend your love. And so I ask in a special sense that you may confirm the decisions that have already been made. And Lord, you may quicken your sons and daughters to make decisions wise for eternity. So Lord, bless your children. We pray that the hosts of darkness will be reverted back by angels from the world of light and glory. Lord, we want to thank you for your children who are writing to us now. We want to ask a special blessing on them. We want to pray, Lord, as they have been enrolled into this particular battlefield, that you will be to them a bulwark. Grant them protection and confidence to rest in you. Bless us this Sabbath day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, before you go, I want to invite you also to a Zoom study session tonight. The title is perhaps something that is intriguing. Why do bad things happen to good people? Faith amidst the flames. We'll be sharing this link out to you, and you can perhaps trace it in this particular um, call right now, this stream right now, 7.30 p.m. I want, we want to see you there. I'm very excited to have you there with me. So God bless you. See you at 7.30.